All right, well, welcome everyone. Um, yeah, that's as um, we, you know, we started Max is really focused on opioids, um, but over the years, regular Max kind of expanded to everything. And um, similarly with Max for Moms, um, originally was to try and get more providers to prescribe buprenorphine and help um, with with people addicted to opioids, but, um, but, you know, we're really trying to cover everything. So, yeah, it's good to, to review a topic here, which is actually much, um, it's, you know, we'll talk a little bit about the epidemiology. It's, it's important to be aware of. So I don't have any financial disclosures. Learning objectives. So we'll talk a little bit about epidemiology. Um, just some things to, to talk about as far as managing withdrawal. We'll talk about why that's important. And then um, we'll talk about um, fetal alcohol and a little bit about managing chronic alcohol use. So just a little bit, you know, because again, I'm not sure what what kind of providers everyone is. So we won't, everything we won't talk about um, pregnancy and, and women will review just some general things about alcohol as well, but um, some just basic numbers here, rough numbers of people who, you know, over 18 who even drink at all, about a quarter have binged, which is um, generally described as more than five drinks per occasion. And we think roughly 17 million people are adults with alcohol use disorder. Here, looking at teenagers, Again, 40% have drank it all, about 13 binge, and you know, over 600,000 that we think meet criteria for alcohol use disorder with teens. And then if we look at you know, just the effects on the family, we won't talk a lot about this outside of the, um, the pregnant person, but um, you know, a lot of families are, are influenced by alcohol even you know, after birth and, um, you know, just all the chronic problems that go along with that. And then down here, looking at fatalities, so roughly 88,000 alcohol-related deaths per year, third leading cause of preventable deaths, about 10,000 from impaired driving, and 2,200 from what, you know, overdose is what um, the official term is, is poisoning. So, so again, a lot of people affected. The little picture here is just showing that, um, you know, there's a much larger number that use, you know, in this 17 million that have actual alcohol use disorder, but there are a lot of people that drink more problematically. We'll talk a little bit more about that. As we look specifically at women, this is from the, people are familiar with the National Survey on Drug Use and Health. So that's an annual survey that's done with the general public trying to get a sense of um, substance use from year to year. And this is just showing just women across different age groups, but you see here 18 to 25, 26 or older, you know, about 50% use, so 56 million there. This is trying to look at some with actual alcohol use disorder. So you see the number smaller here, 26 or older, about 3.4%, 3.8 million. And then here we're looking at pregnant women, and this is looking at all different substances. So you see compared, you know, a little bit less than tobacco, but, but again, looking at pregnant women, we'll talk more, but, um, you know, 197,000 in 2019 or 9.5% um, who reported that they at least were drinking in the year prior. So it's important, I don't know how many people on this have heard this, but you know, we started seeing this you know, pretty soon after COVID hit. Um, we started hearing people were using more substances and specifically drinking more and specifically more women and more young women were drinking and not only drinking, but, you know, concerning down here is the, um, you see, March 2021, this came out starting to see younger women with, you know, not just drinking, but developing really significant health problems from drinking. 
um, seeing more during COVID. So, so again, this is something, you know, this is just emerging, but obviously important with, um, with this talk. Trying to get a hold of um, prevalence of alcohol use and use disorder in pregnancy. Lots of different numbers float around across the world, but you know, kind of taking everything together, roughly 9.8% of women worldwide use alcohol during pregnancy. A lot of variation depending where you are. Australia, you know, they had one study that almost half the women were drinking prior to learning that we're pregnant and about 20% continue to drink after learning. A lot of other cultures, you know, in Europe and all that, alcohol is more kind of part of, um, you know, just daily meals. So not as, as much kind of the prohibition that we have here with drinking during pregnancy. Again, one study here about 18% drink had drunk during the first trimester. So we think roughly about a third who would meet alcohol use disorder, um, pregnant women compared to non-pregnant women, and roughly affecting about 0.6% of preg all pregnancies. So, you know, a lot of, I'm sure people in this webinar have, you know, heard this. And so it's really important that we are screening. We'll focus today really on screening for alcohol. I'm, I'm hoping people are aware of some of the other screeners that are used for drugs and alcohol, um, the four P's or the integrated five P's. We'll talk a little bit more about this one here, the craft, which is often used for um, adolescents, and then the NIDA assist, and there are others, but we'll focus more on some of these ones here and this Sir P that were that have been validated in pregnancy and and really focus on alcohol. So a lot of times you're going to hear people talk about um, a primary screen that comes from the audit, which is a an alcohol specific screener, and really gets at the the consumption question. So it's just asking the you know have you ever drank, and then if you have, how many drinks on the typical day when you drink. And then down here, how often did you have more than five for men, four for women, hourly drinks and one occasion? And these numbers are there because we'll talk about the, the kind of recommended drinking limits. And now we're not talking about pregnancy, we're just talking about in general. These are over, you know, one drink over the limit. So if somebody says yes to this. Um, it means doesn't mean that they necessarily have a drinking problem, but it means that it's something that you want to explore. But as we're asking people about drinking, it's important to, to realize that people, you know, define drinks in different ways. So just a reminder, if people aren't familiar in the US, and again, this varies by country, but in the US, we define a standard drink as roughly 12 to 14 grams of pure alcohol. So that's, you know, like a 12 ounce can of beer, like Budweiser, five ounces of table wine. And then over here, like 40%, that's what a lot of liquors are. There's a lot of variability, but a lot of gin, vodka, rum, whiskey are around 40%. So an ounce and a half is a standard drink. I was just like to remind again, especially, you know, here you could be working with a lot of young people do things um, kind of risk taking and. You know, you're asking people how many drinks they have, but um, sure, certainly if you went to college and just lots of. Um, different ways that people are drinking. I don't know if people know that's Prince Harry there. He's actually snorting vodka. Um, this is another thing if people haven't heard of eyeballing, where you hold the, the liquor really up to your eyeball and it gets absorbed. Really, any any um, part of your body that is has a lot of um, you know vasculature, blood vessels that go to it can absorb alcohol. So, you know, people have heard about um, you know, women doing this with tampons, actually um, using um, also rectally. People inject. This is a newer thing using dry ice to actually, it's almost like vaping alcohol. And so, again, just to remind you as they will be doing things that aren't kind of in those standard drinks. 
also with youth screening again i don't know how what ages some of you might be working with but unfortunately we've lowered you know starting to even talk about alcohol with 9 to 11 year olds 11 to 14 and then certainly in teens to really be asking about drinking so so again in, in some of the areas where some of you practice you may be um, you know working with even younger people I mentioned before those kind of recommended drink limits. Again, this is not during pregnancy. So that we recommend no more than four for men per occasion, three for women in the elderly per occasion, 14 per week and seven per week. Um, and again, if somebody drinks over this does not mean that they have an alcohol use disorder, but these are kind of levels that if someone drinks more than than this, it raises the risk of having problems just in general with alcohol, having a higher chance of developing a, a problem later on, but it also raises the, um, the chances that other comorbid things, say blood pressure, diabetes, depression, anxiety, other things become harder to manage if you're drinking above these levels. So, so again, these numbers are kind of used as a recommendation and the the cutoffs to talk to people about their drinking and, and, you know, question them more about consequences. So, these are some of the, the screeners that have been validated in pregnancy. So, this 1 here, the taste. So, how many drinks does it take to make you feel high? So, trying to get a tolerance. Do you get annoyed? If people are familiar with the cage, a lot of these are kind of barred from the, the cage. Um, Ever felt that you should be cutting down on your drinking? And then this one's getting a tolerance. Have you ever needed a drink in the morning to help you if you're feeling shaky? Um, so having an eye opener. This is down here how you score it. Depends like how many drinks it takes for you to feel something. And then these down here. Another one that's validated in pregnancy is called the tweak. Um, so it also asks about tolerance. Do you have friends or relatives that are worried or complain about your drinking, about the eye opener, amnesia, or having blackouts where you don't remember what you did when you were drinking? And this, I don't really like mnemonics that um, have to change the letters because then it's hard to remember, but um, they also talk about the cutting down there. This is the other one there. It's called the SERP P. This is a real kind of brief one. Just ask specifically about marijuana. This one asks specifically about alcohol, and then if you ever felt the need to cut down. So, so again, just mentioning a few of the ones that have been validated um, for use during during pregnancy. All right. Okay. Yeah, I, I always forget when I'm talking to this group. We probably have CPS workers watching. So. I should take out my um, my son's baby picture, but um, but I just want to kind of talk about um, a little bit the nature versus nurture, or as we're talking about alcoholism, we think you know about sixty percent is genetic. So it's so again important even prenatally to know about your patients and and kind of talk about. Certainly, you wouldn't say yes, you have an alcohol use disorder, you shouldn't have kids, but you know people should be aware of the. Um, the genetic predisposition and important again as you're um, you know working with younger people um, to also be aware of that. Just some of the genetic factors that are involved. Again, it's like with many behavioral things and many addictions, you don't really inherit the whole thing. You inherit a predisposition to develop addiction or a a psychiatric disorder. So similarly, we see that you know different studies have shown, um, you know, depending on which relatives and the kind of degree of um, relation, um, the risk of developing an alcohol use disorder can go up. Lots of different you know places where genetics can be involved can have to do here with the way alcohols um, metabolized. We'll talk more about it. A lot of it in the system or with other addictions has to do with kind of impulsivity and disinhibition, which is really important with alcohol. And then also around lower levels of response to alcohol. And they've done really interesting studies looking at um, children of people with alcohol use disorder 
who actually have a lower level of response. It's almost like they have a, a built in tolerance and they've done studies literally with um, teenagers who had never drank before gave them alcohol and then measured how much they swayed and the children of people with alcohol use disorder actually swayed less to the same amount of alcohol so they had a, a lower response it was all like again it was almost as though they had a um, built-in um, tolerance to alcohol so so again it's just important to, to be aware of this as you're working with people and 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 people who um, are around pregnancy Talking just a little bit about the difference in how alcohol is distributed in our bodies and big differences between men and women. Um, it goes to because it's very, you know, it goes to places with a lot of water solubility. It's why we can also use um, like a breathalyzer to kind of approximate the, the blood goes to your brain very quickly um, because of that flow. And it also is important for um, the fetal circulation we'll talk more about. So again, we're not gonna spend a lot of time on the, the details of metabolism, but just to mention, and we'll talk at the end about the medications we use to treat alcohol use disorder, but there are two main um, enzymes in our bodies that break down alcohol. So this one called alcohol dehydrogenase, one called aldehyde dehydrogenase. And so um, like acid aldehyde, if you block this one, which is what we'll talk about in abuse people may have heard of, blocks this one. So you get a buildup of this in your body and then you, you can get, feel sick, you feel flushed, you can have nausea. Um, there are differences in these in, in a lot of different, um, different racial groups and also between men and women. Again, we talked a little bit about some of those differences. There are differences in the, the one enzyme between men and women. And the differences, again, just kind of in general, the volume of distribution. So women tend to have um, less volume. So that means that for the same amount of alcohol, you see here, the bottom rows here, women, for the same amount of alcohol, women will have a higher blood alcohol level because of that difference in um, the distribution. All right. So now talking about drinking during pregnancy, and I don't know if anyone's ever seen one of these, but this is a picture um, somebody took from a bar, actually. It's a little machine in a bar where you can get do a, a quick pregnancy test if you want to know before you're, you know, you're going to have a drink in a bar. So I thought that was a pretty interesting um, kind of really harm reduction um, thing. I've not seen one, but I, I found that picture. So some of the things that alcohol can do during pregnancy, and this is with mom. So increased risk of these kinds of complications, miscarriage, preterm labor, placental abruption, can get first and second trimester bleeding, intraamniotic infections. And with the fetus, you can get increased um, rates of stillbirth, low birth weight, congenital abnormalities, we'll talk more about, cognitive deficits, and behavioral problems. Just showing the kind of the way that the, the fetus develops from, you know, a few weeks up to birth and the different organs and then different things that are going on in the central nervous system um, that become important when we're talking about fetal alcohol syndrome. So here talking about fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. So this includes what you know the, what most people think of fetal alcohol disorder, but other things that we refer to alcohol related birth defects and neurodevelopmental disorders. It's sort of like just trying to get a hold of how many people drink during pregnancy. There are different rates of prevalence. Here you see a huge range worldwide from anywhere from 0.2 per thousand births to nine per thousand births. But people estimate somewhere around the 7.7 .7 per thousand live births worldwide. About one in 67. 
who do. And here in the US, we think it's you know lower than this number here, but you know, somewhere around one, one and a half, two percent of per thousand live births in the US. Some of the factors that seem important with this, the amount of alcohol, the timing of the exposure, and concomitant tobacco use seem to raise the, the chances. Other things that are important as far as mom, the her maternal age, genetics, body composition, and nutritional status um, during the pregnancy. And then some of the features, um, so this means a smaller head, shorter height, lower body weight, um, short palpebral fissures, smooth philtrum, the, the thing kind of under your nose here, thinner upper lip, and then some of the more behavioral, um, poor coordination, lower intelligence, behavioral problems, and sight problems. So it's again something we really want to to try and and help to avoid. Dr. Walsh, we got a question in the chat. Mm -hmm. Um, so this person asked, we stopped breathalyzers during COVID. Do you think that using the breathalyzer for alcohol testing is now safe in our clinics? Yeah, I think. I mean, certainly now we're, we're starting to unmask and everything in clinics. So I think, yeah, that should be okay. I mean, obviously you want to still take precautions, but. I'm um, just looking just a reminder of you know the different body systems that alcohol affects um, because this will affect you know if you have a pregnant woman who's who is also experiencing some of these problems that all these things could complicate the pregnancy so um, lots of different areas that alcohol affects a lot of the GI tracts liver pancreas you can get different kinds of ulcers the esophagus um, can get, you know, can have problems and actually bleed. Um, heart can be, you know, you can have a cardiomyopathy, an enlarged heart, you can, you can cause arrhythmias, hypertension, um, can, you know, other things we'll talk more about, and then effects on the, the brain, obviously. And people kind of divide the effects of alcohol into the primary diseases um, that I, most of them I just mentioned, liver, cardiomyopathy and all, but a lot of secondary diseases associated with a lot of different cancers, diabetes, other GI diseases, pancreatitis, pneumonia. So, so again, a lot of things that could complicate the pregnancy if, if this is also going on. So now we'll talk about um, alcohol intoxication and withdrawal, um, like how to manage if if you have somebody come in, certainly in your in your clinic, but um, especially when they're coming into the hospital and during delivery. Um, yeah, I won't go too much into this because I'm sure people are aware, but um, you know, alcohol intoxication, you know, comes on pretty quickly. A lot of differences I mentioned is between gender and race, um, as far as metabolism that will affect that. And you know, people can die from this largely from respiratory depression. It can affect the part of our brains that control our breathing. Um, but also, people can have significant problems. Say if they are um, if they vomit, especially if they're lying on their back, vomit and then can aspirate in their lungs. Um, obviously, can really be really bad. Just some of the things people always think like alcohol is warming you up, but actually it tends to um, dilate your blood vessels and and um, and actually cool you. So people think like they drink when they go skiing, and that's going to help, but um, but it doesn't. Managing alcohol intoxication, really again protecting somebody's airway so that again if they do vomit that they don't um, aspirate their vomit into their lungs. Um, sometimes they may have problems with their, you know, electrolytes or their fluids. So you want to replace that. And then real important to examine for evidence of trauma. A lot of times in an emergency department, somebody will come in, they just, you know, they look really drunk. So people kind of put them in the corner to let them sober up and they actually have a really bad head injury. 
in, in addition to being intoxicated and, you know, that everyone's just kind of ignoring the fact that, that it could have a head injury because they think they're just drunk. So really important to, to not forget that when people are intoxicated, they often injure themselves. We're, we're now going to start talking about withdrawal, but just a little bit, um, alcohol is a very dirty um, chemical or drug interacts with many of our different, um, you know, neurotransmitter systems, other um, hormonal systems. Um, again, we think a lot of the pleasure people get is from the dopamine and the opioid system, but um, GABA, it's one of our main um, inhibitory neurotransmitters. NMDA is our main excitatory. 5-HC, this is serotonin. So again, it's just to, to highlight there are a lot of different neurotransmitters that are involved with it. Um, and that becomes important when we talk about managing withdrawal. So now, alcohol withdrawal. Important to remember that the vast, vast majority of people in alcohol withdrawal, it's self-limited, uncomplicated, they don't need medication. Um, but again, a lot of times when you're working in a hospital, you're gonna see some of the more serious cases. And, and obviously pregnant women who come in um, might have a higher rate of having a problem. Um, again, can be fatal. We'll talk about the two main syndromes that you see with alcohol withdrawal. So people, you know, kind of break down alcohol withdrawal in different ways, but one way is to think of it in three stages. So stage one, typically seen within about the first 24 hours after somebody last drank, usually lasts for a day or two, and the vast, vast majority never progress. And so, you know, this one you see the person might be a little shaky, have a little bit increased blood pressure, a little bit higher heart rate, sweaty, upset stomach. Um, at the most, they might talk about this derealization where things around them just don't quite feel normal, but they're otherwise very, you know, they're alert oriented. Um, you know, they're not delirious that we'll, we'll talk more about. Stage two, typically seen within about 48 hours, much like stage one, but here you can start to see people sometimes talk about hallucinosis. So this isn't really a full blown hallucination. A lot of times people will describe just kind of hearing their name being whispered or, um, you know, kind of odd um, auditory experiences like that um, can be visual and generally they're not life threatening. But again, the person's reality testing is intact. They're oriented and they recognize this is a, is a weird thing going on. That's to distinguish it from stage three, which is what we think of as delirium tremens, DTs. Um, again, overall cases of alcohol withdrawal, it's less than 1%. But if you work in a medical setting, you're, you're going to see a higher percentage of these. Um, kind of classically comes along about 72 hours after somebody last drank, though though it can certainly be sooner or it can be later, especially if somebody other also uses other things like um, benzodiazepines. If it's not treated, it can last, and I have here, you know, up to a week, but um, we've seen people um, become delirious and stay delirious for weeks. So it's really important to try and um, get ahead of this and treat it and not let somebody go into DTs. Um, usually it's seen with um, older people who also have other complicating conditions, other medical problems. Um, generally, you're not gonna see it in a, you know, a teenager and even generally people even in their 20s, um, you certainly can, but tends to be more in, in older people. But here you can have hallucinations in any of the sensory modalities, often very threatening, though it doesn't have to be. The person can be calm and um, kind of quietly delirious, but many people are very agitated, anxious, fearful, um, and they're markedly disoriented, um, often will think that they're in different places than, than they are and interact with you as though, you know, they think they're in a church and they'll interact with you as though you're, you know, somebody in the church. 
And then separate from DTs is alcohol withdrawal seizures. Um, and so this is really an a independent thing. So you, know, you can have generalized tonic-clonic seizures. This is often earlier. So remember DTs is typically about 72 hours. Alcohol withdrawal seizures can be 12 to 48 hours after last use. Um, and so the person can otherwise look pretty okay. They may not start having, you know, any um, tremors or increased blood pressure, sweating or any of that. They can look pretty okay and then have a seizure. So really important to kind of think of this as a separate thing from DTs and ask anyone who has a significant alcohol problem if they've ever had withdrawal seizures because you really want to prepare and try and um, prevent that from the beginning can be later than a day. And again, usually if it's later, they're also using other sedatives like benzodiazepines. Um, again, this we feel this is probably less than about 5% of withdrawal cases, um, but again, might be more if you're seeing somebody in the hospital. Most of them are self-limited. Um, you know, they some people go into what's called status where you just keep seizing, but most people will have a single seizure and that's it. So looking at alcohol withdrawal in pregnancy, there are actually very few studies that have looked at this. Um, some people think at least theoretically that there's an increased risk in pregnancy because there's increased cortisol with withdrawal and that um, could be, you know, with the different changes in, during pregnancy could raise the risk. But, but again, it's really more of a theoretical, not, um, not something that has been really Born out in, in studies. Um, important though, because often we do see increased blood pressure with alcohol withdrawal. And obviously that in and of itself can be more problematic during pregnancy where you already have a lot of times people with um, increased blood pressure and the effects that that can have on placental perfusion. So it's so again, some unique things about um, alcohol withdrawal and pregnancy to be aware of. Also to be aware that the, the neonate can have withdrawal, um, kind of like, you know, what the adult would have. So they can actually have some tremor, kind of lower muscle tone, restlessness, um, excessive mouth movements, inconsolable crying, and um, abnormalities in their reflexes. Um, these are also similar. We'll we'll talk in a minute about benzodiazepine withdrawal. So as far as how to treat alcohol withdrawal, um, again, many people don't need a medication. They just need supportive fluids. And but um, but if they do, really the the major treatment is benzodiazepines. These are some other things that are that are sometimes used. And again, right now we're talking about in general, not just in pregnancy, um, but barbiturates or other sedatives, some of the anticonvulsants are used, beta blockers sometimes just to keep the heart rate down. Um, we don't see this as much now, but some places actually give people alcohol to treat their alcohol um, withdrawal. And then some other things that we sometimes see down here that are that are used. But benzodiazepines are really the, the primary thing used. Um, when we're looking at pregnancy, again, there's very few actual studies looking at alcohol withdrawal in pregnancy, um, doing those supportive measures. And like I said before, a lot of times, because you're gonna have tend to have more younger women with um, that are pregnant, you may have a less, less um, prevalence of withdrawal than you would kind of all women in general, where you're going to have, you know, 50, 60, 70 year olds who are going to be at higher rate of having withdrawal if they drink heavily. We still, again, don't have a lot of studies, but benzodiazepines have the most, you know, track record for managing withdrawal. They're all category D that we'll, we'll talk about in a minute as far as pregnancy. There really isn't any clear evidence of which one might be better to use during pregnancy. Um, in general, you want to use something that's fairly long acting, like chlorodazepoxide, which or um, diazepam, um, 
they're longer acting. Diazepam is also parenteral, so it can help say if somebody's um, you know unable to take oral or um, thing that. It, it can help with that as opposed to um, chlorodias, epoxide, or Librium, which um, is oral. There's, you know, some evidence gabapentin, which is an anti seizure medication, which is also used for other things, is used some now in alcohol withdrawal with non pregnancy. Um, again, just not really studied, but, um, but, you know, to consider that it might help. To add it to a benzodiazepine. Just a little bit on benzodiazepines in pregnancy, because um, you know, for many, many years, people have said you just shouldn't use them. A lot of data going back to the 60s and 70s, especially with diazepam, which is Valium. Um, some of the early studies showed that there seemed to be an increase in cleft lip and palate. Um, a lot of different kind of meta analyses and reviews that have tried to really, really tease this out. And it, it, it seems as though a lot of um, what we were seeing back in the 60s and 70s, a lot of the studies were just not well done. They were not well controlled. Um, it, it's really, again, it's just not clear um, how dangerous they are. Um, especially different doses, you know, lower doses may not be so bad. Um, again, down here, there was a big Swedish study that saw no higher rates of um, any kind of major malformation to cardiac effect defects. So, so again, this talks really about alcohol, but to be aware that even with benzodiazepines, the, um, the literature is mixed. But certainly given the risks to both mom and the baby of um, significant alcohol withdrawal, like DTs or seizures, um, probably you know, using a benzodiazepine for the days that are necessary to prevent or treat alcohol withdrawal is, um, is safe to do. Another thing to be aware of when with benzodiazepines in pregnancy, and again, if you were to um, use a benzodiazepine to manage alcohol withdrawal um, close to birth, um, there's a it's called floppy infant syndrome, where you see the the, the newborn can be mildly sedated, um, low tone in their muscles, decreased suck, um, some apneic spells, and you know, it's generally some you see for hours, maybe a day or two, but it has been described for even longer. Usually this is, you know, thought to result from benzodiazepine exposure at the time of delivery. And much of it is also thought to be people who are taking benzodiazepines chronically through the pregnancy. Not as clear, again, if somebody gets a day or two of, say, diazepam to manage alcohol withdrawal, if you're going to see that. But, but again, just to be aware of it. Um, just how we we uh, manage alcohol withdrawal, if people aren't familiar, often there are different scales that are used. This is probably the most common one that rates the different signs and symptoms of alcohol withdrawal. I just put in here Wernicke's encephalopathy. Um, we sometimes see this also when people come in the hospital. See it much less now. It's, it's really... Um, due to a thiamine deficiency that used to be seen decades ago much more often. Now many um, you know, alcohol producers actually put thiamine in the alcohol to help prevent um, somebody developing deficiency when they're drinking. But, but you can see you know, nystagmus, lateral gaze paralysis, ataxia, confusion, diplopia, short-term memory deficit. So, so again, it's pretty rare, but you do want to be aware of it and, and Give thiamine. So, lastly, we're just going to talk about the medications that are used to treat ongoing, uh, like maintenance treatment for alcohol use disorder. And we'll just talk here. This is, you know, people have heard of the um, kind of the pleasure, the reinforcement pathway that we think is responsible for addiction. So, the nucleus accumbens ventral tegmental area, it's where the dopamine is released that that we think is what's reinforcing and leads to, to um, continued substance use. 
a lot of different other neurochemicals are involved there and keflin here that's um, the opiates gaba glutamate um, a lot of different systems and that's important when we talk about the medication so we have three things approved here in the u.s disulfiram or antibuse naltrexone or um, there's either a daily pill or a, a monthly injection and then a third one that's called a campersate or camprol. Other things that are often used off label, um, gabapentin, I mentioned sometimes can help with withdrawal. That's also being looked at for um, kind of a maintenance medicine, topiramate being looked at. So, so a few other things as well, but these are the three that are FAA approved in the US. Anabuse or disulfiram, that's the one that blocks that one um, enzyme I told you that's important for breaking down alcohol. So it, you get a buildup of acetaldehyde and that's what makes people feel, you know, they can get nausea, vomiting, flushing. So the idea is the person takes this knowing that if they drink while they're taking it, it's going to make them feel really sick. So it's kind of using this aversive conditioning model. Um, it can be liver toxic in and of itself. So a lot of people who have really bad liver disease from drinking can't take it. Um, it's also important um, because it can affect copper and that can actually be a problem for um, during the pregnancy and for the newborn. And as far as pregnancy, very, very few studies. Some of the animal studies show that um, you can have actually reduced brain weight, and that could be something to do with that copper that I mentioned. Very, very little studies in humans. Um, this one case report talked about some congenital abnormalities in about 29, 30% of infants whose mother took it, but it's not clear how many of these mothers were also drinking during the pregnancy and that it could have been just from that. Now, Trexone, the second medicine I mentioned. So now Trexone is an opioid blocker. So it's also used to treat opioid use disorder, but we think that it blocks the input of the opiate system into that pleasure pathway. And so when somebody drinks, they're not getting as much pleasure from it. It's not as reinforcing. And so we think that's how naltrexone helps some people to, um, to not drink as much. Um, it's generally you know, well tolerated. It doesn't make somebody sick like the antabuse does when they drink with it. Very rarely it can affect liver, so you want to follow that. Um, and again, I mentioned there's a daily pill or a monthly injection that people can get. Again, very, very little data during pregnancy. No evidence at all of teratogenicity with it. Um, there were, you know, here with some, I can't remember whether these were guinea pigs or whatever, but giving them much, much higher doses than humans would get, and they saw some increased rates of fetal loss um, and a very small amount, again, with very high doses on birth weight, but virtually not studied in, in, human, in humans. Um, exposed babies were sometimes born earlier and some urogenital birth defects. These are in studies where women were receiving it for opiate use disorder. Um, which again, there aren't very many. It's it's not used in opiate use disorder nearly as much as methadone and buprenorphine are. Um, but again, some people tried to look at did it affect have much effect on um, the baby. And then the third medicine there, a camper seed, that works at our on our glutamate system. And people think what it does is kind of helps with craving and the, the kind of unconscious um, cues that that lead people, some people to, um, to drink more. Um, the biggest problem with it is a, um, probably its biggest side effect is diarrhea, can have nausea, doesn't have any problems with liver. So it's um, you know, much better if somebody has a liver problem. But again, barely studied. Um, the animal studies don't show that it, any teratogenicity. Um, 
it actually, there's one or two studies that it actually could be neuroprotective. Um, those effects on the, the glutamate system. Um, and so that it might actually help protect the fetus's brain a little bit if mom is drinking during pregnancy. But again, it's, it's really just the, um, very, very, not very much in the way of actual data, but that, but it's something interesting to think about. Um, hardly looked at in humans, but um, in Australia, there was one study um, that showed that it actually helped, you know, keep, keep people out of the hospital during the pregnancy. Um, and there was no difference in birth weight, growth, birth defects, another case series um, of, you know, 18 people that took it during with first trimester exposure, two spontaneous abortions, two with birth abnormalities, but there was no comparison group. So it's hard to know again um, if mom was also drinking and, and that. So it's again just to be aware we have these three medications. Most of the major groups like ACOG and you know the other groups don't recommend taking these medications during pregnancy just because they haven't been studied much. Um, but there, there are more calls to think about it more. If you have somebody that really is drinking significantly throughout the pregnancy, we do know that, uh, you know, obviously the drinking is problematic. And so, um, so we really do need more studies to see if, um, especially again, this one here, where there is this possible chance that it actually might help, um, you know, protect the, the, the fetus's brain development. Um, you know, I think it's something that really needs to be looked at more. Oops. In there, but. All right, so, so again, just trying to, to do a real overview of alcohol in general. And then again, there, there, a lot of it just really hasn't been studied. It's, it's amazing how much we've had a lot more with opiate use disorder than with alcohol, even though, um, you know, We've had a bigger alcohol problem for much longer than opiates in pregnancy, but um, but again, just not especially the the maintenance medications haven't been studied. But even managing alcohol withdrawal, um, just not the amount that it, it really needs to be studied. So, so if you guys have questions, and again, this was already mentioned, um, kind of our max for moms and some of the things and different ways to contact us if you guys have questions. So. So I do see some things flashing up. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Walsh. We've gotten some great feedback so far. Um, one of the questions that popped up while you were going over those medications was, are those medications offered through a clinic or through primary care doctors? Yeah, none of these, like uh, methadone or buprenorphine, the, so none of these are controlled substances. So there's no, um, you know, there's no, limitations on how they're done. So they're all, um, it could be right through a, an OB or primary care. Um, they're all, you would, well, so except for the, the Vivitrol, the monthly injection of naltrexone, which you would go in and get the injection, you know, from the healthcare provider, everything else you would go and get a prescription at the pharmacy. Great, thank you. Um, and then someone mentioned a book by Emily Oster, which um, talks about how there are no studies that can prove light to moderate drinking cause any problems in the fetus. So moms are reading this book and are taking her advice. Um, they just want to know what your opinion is on this. Yeah, it's really it's 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 so hard because we just don't know. You know this. Um, you know, I mean, clearly the things that we see with fetal alcohol, you know, there are areas where it must be happening, but, but again, we know a lot of women are drinking before they find out they're pregnant, sometimes weeks and months. We know that there are a lot of cultures where, you know, women drink, you know, say have a glass of wine every day during the pregnancy and don't see. So, yeah, it's, it's hard when we just don't have, it'd be really nice if we had an exact amount that you have to drink or an exact period where we know 
this is what's going on. Um, but it's unfortunately, it's just not so so clean like that. So, um, so in general, most countries, the recommendation is because we don't know the safest thing is just don't drink in that way. It definitely can't happen. Um, but, um, you know, but it does get hard when um, a lot of people say, well, I did drink and, you know, my, my kid turned out fine. So what, what do you do with that? And it's really, again, all we can do is kind of um, educate, you know, this is the safest thing that you can do. Great, thank you so much. Um, we don't have any questions right now in the chat. If you do have any others, please feel free to throw them in there. Um, while we wait for some more questions to come in, I'm just going to reiterate that you will receive an email with the slides to the email that you registered with. So please look out for that. That'll include additional information about contacting Max for Moms. Um, and if, if the survey does not pop up in WebEx when you exit this browser, you will be emailed a link from Qualtrics. If you are a call-in user, I do ask that you just email us directly to maxtraining at som.umaryland.edu because we don't always have your information if you don't put in that user pin. Um, so we may not be able to know your name. So please email us directly just to let us know that you called into today's presentation. Um, other than that, if you do not have any questions, feel free to log off with us today. Dr. Walsh will stay on for about two more minutes to answer anything else that trickles in. Oh, it looks like we just got a question. Um, Dr. Walsh, what are your thoughts on allowing the OV peer administrator field benzo testing to ensure the safety of the moms? I think that's benzo. They just said BZ. So again, what was the question? Um, what are your thoughts on allowing the OB peer administrator field BZ testing to ensure the safety of the moms? Oh, I'm not really and, sure what the, the peer, but um, meaning should we be testing for benzodiazepine use similar to like cannabis, opioids, cocaine? I'm sorry, they actually followed up and said, I meant BZ testing for alcohol consumption. A breathalyzer? Is that what? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the important thing with alcohol, though, is um, we metabolize alcohol very quickly. So it doesn't stay in your system for like a few, you know, like cocaine cannabis, opioids, they're all going to be in your system for days. The metabolites are going to be there for days after someone's last use it. Alcohol isn't going to be that. It's it's gone within, you know, hours at the most a day. So um, so the breathalyzer can help help you know if somebody currently or has recently drank, but that's not going to give you a real good picture of somebody who, you know, is drinking could be drinking regularly, but just didn't drink before they came in to, um, to see you. So, um, so it's not breathalyzers, especially are not a, a great way or, or even um, urine tests for alcohol are not the best, um, the best to kind of monitor that. Great, thank you. Um... The time is now 1 p.m. So if any other questions are entered into the chat or you email them over to us, we will be able to follow up um, with a Max team member. So thank you all for logging on today. Please look out for those follow up emails and look out for a link to the recording of today's webinar within one business week on the Max for Moms website. Thanks. Thanks all. Great. Thanks everybody. <laughs>